Good afternoon and welcome back to Queens College. Isn't it wonderful to be back in real life here in Lafrac, this wonderful, gorgeous space, part of the renowned Aaron Copeland School of Music, which is at the heart of our new Queens College Art School. Join us on May 5th for the opening event with the Arts Walk. You are all welcome. Today, though, is our first ever Black, Latinx, and Caribbean Students Day, and I'm humbled as your president, Frank Wu, to be welcoming you on this occasion, sponsored by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and coordinated by our own Latin America and Latino Studies program. It's by, for, and about students, especially. That's why we're all here. I know that we've just gone through more than two years of something none of us could, could ever have imagined. Yet now as we emerge and see old friends again, meet new friends, and we're among strangers, who would have thought the, there would be such joy in being among strangers instead of seeing the same faces again and again at the dinner table or seeing just people in little boxes on your iPad on one of these virtual platforms, but to be among strangers, to, to enjoy civic life, the hurly-burly of the public square. That's what this is about, and it's especially for the benefit of our students. I'm delighted by the show of support from so many accomplished panelists, musicians, and my esteemed colleagues here on stage, President Dr. Anthony Monroe of the Borough of Manhattan Community College, and Dr. Daisy Coco de Filippis, a Queens College alumna of the Eugenio Maria de Hostos Community College who are participating in the first panel. We're especially proud that Queens College right now is serving 6,000 students who identify as Black, Latinx, or Afro-Latino, many who trace their ancestry to the Caribbean. I also wish to take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of Queens College first Chief Diversity Officer and Dean of Diversity, Jerima DeWeese, herself from Barbados. Dean DeWeese has taken on so many responsibilities to make real, tangible, meaningful diversity, equity, and inclusion so that it is not just a rhetorical slogan. And working uh, side by side with her, I have seen uh, what she has accomplished in just a few short months, helping to support our heritage-related activities and recognition and uh, creating our new uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory group, reaching out to address the various issues on our campus as on any campus, and to help celebrate what we stand for inclusion in the American dream that beckons the world over, that attracted you and your parents and grandparents to these shores, knowing that higher education is what will propel you upward, and not just you alone as individuals, but your families and your communities. So I want to thank Dean DeWeese for everything that she has done and will do. You know, with our two years experience in this pandemic, we know that especially the Black, Latinx, and Caribbean communities were affected disproportionately. That's why this is such an important opportunity for us to gather and reflect on how we've become all too familiar with illness, loss, death, and yet resilience and care with the support with our abiding belief in the social contract, that we're in this together, that we are not alone, that when I wear a face mask or I'm vaccinated, that's not just for me, it's for you as well, and vice versa. Our panelists today include prominent educators and administrators from throughout the City University of New York system, which we are a proud member of, and the students who live in some of the most affected areas of the city, and the head of Elmhurst Hospital. We all know that year and a half ago, Elmhurst was the center of the center of the center of what happened and the heroism of the healthcare workers on the front lines deserves our deepest respect and support. Our students represent our future. That's why uh, I am so touched by the leadership of students in putting this together. 
I want to thank as well the moderator of the first panel, our esteemed Regina Bain, the new director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum located in the Corona neighborhood, which connects us to jazz, to art, to the vitality of, of a great performer. And it's fitting that we're here in Lefrac Hall uh, in anticipation of the opening of our Queens College Art School. As president of Queens College, I want to thank you for all that you do, for your resilience, for your care for one another. And I know that the students depend on us, faculty and staff, and they wouldn't have been able to do this without so many who have helped them. So I will welcome to the podium Professor Zadia Feliciano, who has done so much behind the scenes to put together this terrific day. Professor. Uh, thank you, President Wu, um, for your welcoming words. Um, and before we start the panel, I would like to say some thank yous. Um, so first, uh, thank you to President Wu and his office for um, making this day possible. Um, the Dean of Social Science, Kate Pechankina and her Pechankina and her office, uh, Dean of Arts and Humanities, Bill McClure, and um, and his staff, uh, Provost Elizabeth Henry, Associate Provost Alicia Alvero, and their staff, Director of the Kupferberg Center, John Yanovsky. Um, Carlos Cuestas and the, Kupfer, uh, the Kupferberg team, President uh, for Communications and Marketing, Jay Hershenson and his staff, Chief of, of the Library, Simone Yarwood and her staff, the QC IT for um, uh, all your support, uh, faculty from Art Department, English Department, Hispanic Languages and Literature, and Media Studies who help with the student contests, which are Professor Chloe Bass, Tony Gonzalez, Vanessa Perez Rosario, William Orchard, Juan Camaño, Bryce Otis Leon, Sara Hinojos, and Leslie McLeave. And moderator, um, moderators, Regina Bain, um, for the exec, uh, who is the executive director of the Louis Armstrong um, House and Museum, Professor uh, Francois uh, Pierre Louis uh, from the uh, Political Science Department, all presenters of the community leaders and, uh, and administrator panel, uh, Dr. Daisy Coco de Filippis, um, uh, president of Austin's Community College. Um, Dr. Anthony Monroe, president of the Borough of Manhattan Community College, um, President Wu, uh, president of Queens College, and um, Ms. Helen Arteaga Landa Verde, chief executive office, officer at the um, New York Health and Hospital Armhurst, and um, this all the staff and panelists from the Queens College uh, faculty panel, uh, the Student Clubs Association of Latino Professionals in Finance and Accounting, the Black Student Union, Hispanic Clubs, um, QC Student Association, and all the students who are here participating, and all the faculty and staff who are here today um, for this inaugural day, and I hope you enjoy um, the presentations. And um, I will I would like to introduce you with Regina Bain, our moderator. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Regina Bain, Executive Director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum, and it is my pleasure to moderate our initial panel. Let's jump right in. So this will, question will be for each of the panelists, and then from there, we'll open it up for discussion. Please, panelists, feel free to jump in um, with discussion questions and, and things that are on your heart. And at the end, we'll have a chance for a few questions from the audience. So. Miss Helen Landa Verde, CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst. Uh, can we start with you? Sure. 
So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Helena Teglanda Verde. Thank you so much for inviting me, President Wu. This is a great accomplishment, not only for our hospital, but also the partnership that we're gonna, future partnerships that we're gonna have here with Queens College. So I'm gonna answer that question a little bit on how overcoming COVID-19 in our black and Latin communities and overall communities in Queens were affected. So our hospital, we were built to serve, we're actually 190 years old this year. And we are run by one thing, and we're guided by one mission. And that's everyone that walks through our doors gets seen. And I'm just gonna give you a little presentation of our community. And as you can see here, we're gonna start, I'm gonna give you some pictures of what we look like and the communities we serve. As you guys can see, if you guys are from Roosevelt, Jackson Heights, or Corona, or Elmer, we're very diverse, we're very overcrowded. Our community is from low income. Actually, 57% of our population speaks another, another language other than language, than English. And also, our community is under, around 37% of our community is uninsurable. That means they do not have access to insurance because of their immigration status. And Health and Hospital Elmer sees the majority of these communities, which makes sense because it's, we're guided by our mission of seeing everybody through our doors. As you guys can see, we're very overcrowded. We're working poor. We do a lot of stuff. And this is just around Jackson Heights. This is our community. Um, we had a walkout to a clap out to celebrate the one year anniversary of COVID and all 4,500 of our employees came out in phases um, to applaud for what we did during the pandemic. Um, as you can see, these are the zip codes that we service. And like I mentioned before, 15% of our community lives in poverty. 57% speaks another language other than English. And 48% of our patients are foreign born. And that is really important for you to understand because when you're foreign born and you get to this country, getting used to the healthcare system in the US is very different from our home countries. So that becomes a barrier. One of the things that we try to do to kind of face some of these challenges is that we're a level one trauma center. We have a pediatric emergency room. We have a level three NICU. We have an amazing behavioral health center, both inpatient and outpatient. We service 1.1 million people a year, and we have 545 beds, which I have to tell you guys is not enough. And also one of the things that we do is we speak a lot of languages. Actually, Elmer's Hospital spends about $3 million on languages services which equates four million interpretation minutes. Funny fact about your beloved hospital, we speak more languages than Google. Google speaks <laughs> only 109. We speak 125. And our vendor can speak 180. So Google has some catching up to do. <laughs> now, I still can't believe, you know, kind of going back to what our president was saying here, I can't believe it's been two years since the pandemic hit us. One of the things that it did, it, it really hit us like a tsunami. We know these things happen, but when it hit our front door, not only were we like in shock of what came through our doors, but we were also overwhelmed. And as you can see from the pandemic data, which is no surprise to anybody here, is that we were the epicenter of the epicenter. And when you look at the zip codes in the little, within the blue circles, you'll see that those communities were largely Latino and black communities. And also, it's the heart of where Elmer sits. So as you can see, one of the things what we did when the pandemic hit us is we actually took a deep breath. We literally took a deep breath because we were so overwhelmed. We were overwhelmed in two ways, in the amount of patients that were coming through our doors, the amount of information, but also the amount of community support. So one of the things that we did, we took a pause in the midst of the pandemic and said, okay, what are we doing really well? How do we do it better? And what are things that we should stop doing? So we developed strategic <coughs> action plans in both wave two and wave four. We developed incident command centers. We informed We started forming structures to make sure that we were meeting all the needs and different types of needs that we needed. We one of the things lessons learned was that we needed a communication plan. The communication plan was not only within our employees, but with our community members. I can't tell you how many town halls we did. I have my doctors here who did even more town halls. I would say easy. We've done over 100 uh, town halls in our communities and within ourselves. We created an email address for anyone that wanted to come and talk to us and see what Elmas was doing. 
and we did letters from the CEO. We created a resource hub so anyone from the community or even our employees can get information on what the latest and update that we were doing with the pandemic. And we also started focusing on our workforce. We also realized that the pandemic not only hit our community, but hit us, not only as physicians, as nurses, as techs, as clerks, as administrators, so we needed to be there for each other. So what happened next, right? So we took a pause and then data became our friends. As you can see from these maps, one of the three things that you'll see is the high rates of uninsured, high rates of people having limited in English proficiency, and the high rates of adults reporting that they were not getting access to healthcare because of cost, were well, all in the same zip codes we were serving. So what do we do? We formed a partnership with PCDC and we said, okay, how do we get data to really mean something? And we came up with these indicators. Any dark reds or dark blues meant that that's what an area we needed to focus on. And of course, those were our Black and Latino communities. When we start talking about the recovery stage of the pandemic, we only have a limited amount of resources. So how do we get those resources? We became laser focused. And with using data, we created dashboards. We created dashboards to address those social determinants. We said, what do our community need in prevention medicine? How do we make sure they're getting access to insurance? How do we make sure that they're on the sliding fee scale? How do we make sure they're in programs like New York Cares that regardless of immigration status, you're allowed to get health care? And also, in the vaccine recovery, we literally use data and mapping to say, okay, in that corner on Astoria Boulevard, they need vaccines. How do we get that community to come get vaccinated? And as you can see, one of the other things that we did, we became founding members of the Department of Health Equity Action Plan. And this became a huge thing for us as well because we were able to use racial justice frameworks and population specific plans to better reach our communities. Because one of the things we realized really quickly is that we do not know it all, even though we are doctors, well, not me personally, soon. Um, we are doctors, we're administrators, we don't know it all. We needed our partners, we needed help. And what did that partnership give us? I'm very proud to say, and you guys should all be very proud because Queens has the highest rates of vaccination. We're at 93%. That is huge. <laughs> and if you look at our black and Latino communities, our Latino community is 81% and our black community is 64. And guys, that is to be thankful because there was so much misinformation, so much vaccine hesitancy. Um, during this time of recovery during the vaccine, I swear I wanted to kill the founders of TikTok because no matter what happened, no matter how much information, how many providers I had during town halls, TikTok was beating me. For every good information I was giving out, TikTok had like five, um, you know, and they had more likes than me, so that was not fun. But as you can see, we still, with good information and telling people that the recovery of ending this pandemic, the reason why we're not even ha not wearing masks today is because of the vaccines. So you can see the success of what we did. Sadly, the world did not follow that. As you can see, 50% of the world is only vaccinated. There's still another 50% that needs to get vaccinated. Only 9% currently right now are partially vaccinated. And as you can see, anything in the light blue has no access to vaccines. This is something as pu future public leaders, public health advocates, and just leaders overall, is something we need to address. So what have we learned so far? That public health system is very vulnerable to politics, right? Politics hit hard during the pandemic. Finding the originals of the outbreak can be difficult. You know, a lot of people were like, where did it come from? Where, where was it from? You know, no one really has the answer for that. You know, partnerships between countries was limited. Wealthy countries, you know, even one like ours, we do not share with poor countries. Even though the vaccine was produced quickly and very fast, there's still a lot of things we're unknown and we need to test and get proven. And of course, one of the things that why we're all here today is racial biases and demographic challenges contribute a lot to the pandemic. So not to end on a bad note, but this is, if this one slide you have to remember is this one. You know, as future leaders, and, and the reason why I keep calling you guys all leaders is because if you're in this room, it's because you care what happens to our black and Latino communities. I want you guys in five years to be looking back at this slide and say, did I do any of these? You guys need to form partnerships to make sure policy and advocacy is occurring. 
We need to make sure we have a clear and consistent public message, not only to vaccines, but our, to our health care. We need to make sure you guys join the workforce. Healthcare is not scary. Become the doctors, become the radiologists, become the nurses. We need you guys. Also, I gotta put a plug for telemedicine. I know everybody in here can use a phone, can get onto Zoom. We do have a lot of people in our communities who technology is not their friend. Please help them, teach them how to get onto a web WebEx. It is important because that's gonna become an issue of access in the future. Rapid testing, please make sure you get tested. When in doubt, just get a test. They're free right now. Just enjoy it. Just enjoy it while it lasts. Also, the main thing I also want to make sure is infrastructure. I know us as Elmer's Hospital and my future panelists here, not only do we advocate our local politicians for funding, for our buildings, for infrastructures, for programs, it's one thing for us to ask for money from our local elected officials. It's another thing when you ask. You guys are the voters, you guys are the users, and you're the future of our communities. It's very different when you say, hey, I need money for Elmer's Hospital. I need money for Queens College because I want to make sure not only do I have the right access to healthcare, but I have the right education to make sure that a pandemic like this does not happen to my community again. And that's my long answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Landa Verde. We appreciate the specificity and the experience that you just shared. President Wu, may I, may I bring you forward to um, share your initial thoughts? How did the pandemic affect your community? All right, we're, we're coming up to the podium. You can speak from there if you'd like. All right, I'll, I'll stay here. I spent plenty of time standing at a podium. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with something personal. I always say to the students, my family is just like your family. My parents came to the United States because they believed in the American dream. They thought that there would be opportunity for the next generation here as they could not have found where, where they grew up. And so they sacrificed and, and gave so much in a way that I'm sure my brothers and I, we don't appreciate nearly enough. And so for me to come here to Queens College is coming full circle because I know that my family wouldn't have achieved success without public higher education, American higher education, and what it offered. So I didn't set out just to be a college president. I wanted to be specifically the Queens College president. Two and a half years ago when I was in the search for this role that I'm deeply humbled to hold, I wasn't in other searches. I didn't go looking around to, to be in charge of something. I wanted to be here specifically because this is the world's borough, because I know that, and this isn't just my say-so, it's not opinion. We have experts on our faculty who study this. There's no place anywhere on the face of the globe where people speak as many languages. That's just a fact. If you look at Queens, and this is represented here, in all of the languages, all of the dialects, all of the accents, and there are many places. When I was a kid growing up, my parents had accents, and that meant that even if they weren't quite aware of what was happening, I, I could tell as a kid that our neighbors, their coworkers, were mocking them behind their back because of how they sounded. Even though they strove so hard to have perfect grammar, they could never shake off the accent, and they shouldn't have to, because they could be understood if you just took the time to, to respect them and listen. That's your families too. But here in Queens, there's nothing wrong with having an accent. Here in Queens, no one's going to look at the food that you eat and say, ooh, what's that? Or the faith that you practice and, and condemn it. This is a place where you can come and have a sense of community and not always have to imitate your social superiors and try to assimilate in a way that only confirms that you will, you will never meet that test. And it's represented on this campus because we still stand for the power of higher education. There are institutions of higher education out there, not in the CUNY system that we're proud to be a part of, but there, there are schools, I won't name them, it wouldn't be right for me to criticize any, 
where for one year you have to pay $75,000. Can you imagine that? That means if you go for four years, you have to pay them $300,000. You could buy a house for that much money. And if you graduate at the age of 21 with $300,000 of debt, or if you saddle your parents and grandparents with that debt, you'll be my age or so before you've paid it all off. I'm 55 this year, and I know people who are still paying their student loans who, who are my peers. Imagine that. That's not true here at Queens College. But the pa and, and at our sister institutions in the CUNY system, let me add. Say, yes. Yeah, Alumna of That's right. And Not one penny dead. That's right. And, and, and we are so proud to welcome you back. <laughs> but the pandemic tested that. It tested that because suddenly everything that we believed in, including that American dream, we saw that despite our ideals, that there were barriers to healthcare access. And when you look at it again, this isn't my opinion. This is objective fact. You can go out, you can measure this, and we have scholars here who look at these things. Because of history, because of the structures, because of language access issues, different communities were affected by COVID at different rates. If you had money, you had access to healthcare. You had better healthcare. You got in to see the doctor sooner. You were treated better. And this meant that when you look at the, the fatality rates, when you look at who gets long COVID, you will see stark, unmistakable differences. So it lays bare that there is much work yet to be mm. done. Yeah. And I'd be remiss too if I didn't mention the, the hate, the targeting of the Asian and Asian Americans, including the family members of our students. But allow me to close on an optimistic note. I'll tell you what gives me hope. It is the activism of our students. You, not those who are older, who are the age of your parents or grandparents, and it shocks me to realize I am at least as old as the parents of many, if not most, of the students here. It is you who marched in the Black Lives Matter protests that were so important because as we sheltered in place, we watched in broad daylight the murder of Mr. George Floyd by officers, not just armed, but armed with the authority of the state and the government and of law. And so many others recorded in these viral videos by brave citizen journalists. Yet when people marched, what was so striking to me is just as in the 1960s during the heyday of the, the civil rights movement, that struggle for black equality when Dr. Martin Luther King came to our very own Colden Auditorium to speak after the murders of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner for whom our clock tower is named. Just as back then, but even more so, the Black Lives Matter marches, if you watch them, you saw young people, you saw old people, you saw people who were white and Latino, people who were Jewish and Asian, marching alongside as allies to people who were black, African American, Caribbean, not displacing, but rather coming to say, this cause is my cause too, but I respect that it was the historic struggle for black equality that opened the doors for everyone, that made possible the immigration that brought us here. Because without the 1964 Civil Rights Act, you would not have had the 1965 Immigration Act. It was as a direct result of the great society that Lyndon Baines Johnson signed into law, which was powered by black power that the doors to this nation opened and allowed families like mine to come. So I'm forever indebted. And when I had the opportunity a year ago to go to downtown Flushing for a rally against the, the anti-Asian hate, Lieutenant Governor, then Lieutenant Governor, now Governor Kathy Hochul was there. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer was there. Our borough president, a friend of Queens College, Donovan Richards was there. The civil rights activist Al Sharpton was there. There were leaders who were Latino, there were leaders who were Jewish. And when my term came to stand at the podium, I said, I've never seen this. I've never seen people of so many backgrounds coming together 
for this cause that they weren't even aware of six months ago. That's what gives me hope. Not just that we have all come here to the world's borough, to Queens College, but that now that we are here, because of this pandemic, we realize that we're all in this together because the pandemic is a public health problem, not a private health problem. And we understand now, too, that discrimination is a contagion that passes from one to the other. It's not just about individuals, it's about society as a whole. So this pandemic, as we come out of it, which also is unprecedented, none of us have ever come out of a pandemic, it gives us opportunity. And that's why I have hope for us here at Queens College. Thank you. Thank you, President Green. <laughs> President Daisy Coco de Filipis. Well, my dear students, I am one of you a few decades later. <laughs> And I see you, and I see myself, and I see a really bright future. Not only did Queens College prepare me to be a president at Austin's Community College, but I also left for 12 years to go to Connecticut and be a president there for 12 years. That's how Queens College prepared me. And I have more to say, but when thinking about this event, and later I'll give a lot of details about the South Bronx and how we dealt with this, I thought of writing a letter to you my students, because you're mine in my heart. All of CUNY students are me, younger, younger <laughs> sisters and brothers, or maybe grandchildren. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, 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 so I am going to just say, first of all, President Wu, thank you. I'm so happy to be in the company of all these wonderful dear friends, right? President Monroe, Tony, and, and a new friend because we're also in a Latina group in the governor's uh, 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 project. And so it's great to see everyone, Helen and everyone else here and a new friend uh, running a, a museum now. So mm -hmm. beautiful. I just want to really thank Professor Saida Feliciano, who's the director of Latin American Latino Studies Program, who's the person who communicated regularly with me, who invited me on your behalf. I want to also say that you don't get any closer to the soul of being Caribbean, black, brown, English speaking, Caribbean, <laughs> Spanish speaking, Caribbean, <laughs> French speaking, Caribbean, if you're not close to the arts and music. Mm. And so if you're going to celebrate this moment, and I, I said reflection on this day to celebrate you, our CUNY wonderful students at Queens College. So I'm going to read, it's only two and a half pages and it's large font, so, so do not, <laughs> all right? And I'm happy to take any questions uh, at whatever point. So March 30th, which is today, is a day that brings us closer to the symbolic culmination celebrating Women's History Month. This past week, brought sovereign examples of how far more we need to go to contribute to the restoration or creation of some humanities in the hearts and actions of many, as exemplified by the devastation of Ukraine mm. by blind ambition and the Senate hearings on the confirmation of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court. I cannot tell you the outrage the anger that I felt listening to such incredible. So there's a wonderful article that was an op-ed piece that came out in the New York Times this past week. And, and, and from uh, Maureen Dow, uh, she comments on this Torquemada-like inquis inquisition. And she says, what is a woman? Remember that question? It's awful that one woman was asking that question of another woman, okay? What is a woman? Jackson shows that a woman is someone who stays cool in the face of calumny and is headed for the Supreme Court. And that will be justice for Justice Jackson. And you know, I heard that and I said, read that and I said, wow, this reminds me of my dearest Maya Angelou, with whom I identified and I got to meet in person at one point in my younger, yeah, which is wonderful, okay? Where she says, each time a woman stands up for herself without knowing it possible, without claiming it, she stands up for all women. So I feel that the blessing of a Queen's College education gave me the voice and the space to stand up many times when I need to stand up 
for all of us. And uh, so last week, I spent time with a group of women minority leaders, Black and Latinx, of small businesses and nonprofits who had lessons to share about how they had overcome the ravages of COVID, uh, which is, by the way, the Bronx is, the South Bronx was the hardest hit. I know Elmhurst was also very hard hit. Uh, uh, the community. Uh, okay, and the community, okay. I had a similar experience, uh, and, and so they went on to explain how they continue to move along, making differences in real ways with the communities that they serve. So this woman stood up during a pandemic and very precarious time, and these were women, women of color, black and Latinx, like many of us here, okay? Uh, I, I had a similar experience speaking to two different groups of student leaders at, at also from the SGA and then from the women's basketball team. We were number two nationally, which is a miracle because what do we know? You know? <laughs> but, but so I met with them to, cel to celebrate them, you know? And I asked, I meet regularly with the Student Government Association and I said, so who's graduating in May? And how many of you have a GPA of more than three as you do this service for the community? And there were a good number. And I used to, my practice always had been as a president back for 12 years um, since I came, that I do give a scholarship to SGA leaders who are graduating who have more than a three GPA. So I said, oh boy, this is going to be an expensive commencement, <laughs> okay? <laughs> then, I said to the women's team, and they came, and, and we had cake and coffee, we celebrated. And I said, so how many of my athletes are graduating this year? There was a group of them. Who has over above three? And all of them immediately ch turned to look at the captain. And they said, oh, you need to talk to her, because her GPA is 3.8. And so <laughs> let me just say, so, what does it mean to know? What does it mean to know that even in the face of the isolation, how difficult it has been to, to go through a pandemic, that there's the world to stay the course, and that's what you must do. That's what you always do. Because if you don't, you're just running in place. You need to move on, and you need to move on, and you need to believe in yourselves, and in the fact that for each one of you who is a first generation college student in your family, eventually, sooner than you think, there'll be at least five others from your family who also, whose life will also be transformed. So stay there. What does it mean to know that your education makes a difference? CUNY colleges, and in this I'm so proud of CUNY, I'm so proud of our chancellor, I'm so proud of the work everyone is doing, have used a significant number of initiatives to support students, always, pre and during COVID, always. As you have experienced and have heard already this afternoon, much has been done to mitigate or alleviate the impact of COVID, from supporting technology, training for virtual instruction, you name it, mental health services, uh, we keep a, 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 a food pantry open, we, we provide emergency funds. Believe it or not, at Ostos, the community is so invested in helping us that I have to say there was a goal when I got there last year, uh, two years ago, the first year that I was there, our goal was exceeded by 23% in our foundation to bring funds that all went to the students. And then the work uh, that we do that has been done there uh, to transform different uh, generations was recognized, as was BMCC's, mm -hmm. with the Mackenzie Scott gift that has allowed for all sorts of other initiatives mm -hmm. to support the students. So I just want to tell you just one thing. As I mentioned before, not only did I come here, when we came here, my husband and I were married young. He's also an immigrant. He's also a Queens College graduate. And let me just say that when he came, other people, his younger brother came to Queens College and also graduated really doing really well. And, 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 and all this have come throughout. It allows us, the, the Queens College education my husband ultimately was in political science, but went and opened his own business and he did well. 
graduated with honors in political science here, uh, even though he was thrown out of a class or two for speaking out too much. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but let me just say that uh, we have three sons who are really good, decent human beings, really involved. All three turned out to be college professors. Went on to get their PhDs, their terminal degrees, one is actually a dean of faculty and a professor uh, at, 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 in, in Los Angeles. That's what Queens College, finishing Queens College. And I don't even want to tell you. So this is pay attention to your studies. Here comes, here comes the grandmother and the mother and the auntie giving advice. Uh, please pay attention to your studies, whatever other leadership positions and family obligations, because it means that even through a pandemic, you will be not running in, in place but moving forward with purpose to change your life, that of your family, and then once you do that, you have the obligation to be part of the solution in this world. We all, our humanity owes others getting engaged in ways that goes beyond the self. We have to give beyond the self. So, but before we do that, we wanna make sure that we vote, that we fight for the right to vote, that we insist on voting, and we insist on voting <coughs> and advocating for people who share our values. What? And I'm gonna tell you my list of values. Quality, affordable education, affordable housing, access to health care and child care, fair wages that allow families the dignity to earn their living, and speaking up. That's where you stand up for diverse cultural representation and for marginalized voices and advocating for fairness, wherever you may have a seat at the table. We did have a wonderful event at Ostos to support our Asian and Asian Pacific brothers and sisters. And in fact, we have one state senator, Lou, whom I voted. I was living in Flushing when he was first candidate. I actually signed up the petition so that he could be a candidate. I remind him of that. And Diana, my chief of staff, was one of his students in one of his class. And they, he is called uh, 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 um, uh, an honorary Chino de Bonai by the by a Dominican congressman because we have in the Dominican Republic some, and you need to go taste it. Frank, person who, <laughs> it is comida china criolla, which is, you're gonna get Chinese food in the Dominican Republic with the, with the Dominican spice in the Caribbean <laughs> Creole, Creole taste, okay? So speak up for those and for fairness, wherever you may have a seat. And thank you for the kindness of listening to me this afternoon. Mil gracias. Thank you. Thank you. President Tony Monroe. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I, I want to thank uh, President Wu and, and all those uh, involved uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to be before you, um, the precious and wonderful students at Queens College. Um, I'm not going to uh, be before you long. I did prepare a PowerPoint um, that I'm going to breeze through, uh, and I hope that this uh, PowerPoint will be made available to those that would like to, to see it. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm first generation U.S. citizen born and raised in the Bronx. I was actually born at Fordham Hospital, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, my maternal grandfather uh, was born in Panama and uh, moved to the United States, left a very um, uh, good business in Jamaica, where he was raised um, and where he met my grandmother, maternal grandmother, and settled in the Bronx and bought a house on East 219th Street between White Plains and Barnes, which is still in the family, which is where I grew up in my early years. And he worked hard. He worked at Doctor's Hospital, washing dishes. And by the time he retired, he was the director of food service. And he brought all 13 of his children 
one at a time to the United States. My mom uh, put herself through school to become a nurse and actually worked at Metropolitan Hospital, which is part of New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Um, so I have a very special place in my heart for um, students, especially students of color, um, because that is me. And that is why I have uh, deep respect for the work that is done at the City University of New York. And it is why serving as the president of the Borough of Manhattan Community College is one of the deepest and actually highest honors that I could have. BMCC is part of CUNY, which is the largest public urban university in the country. You all know that. Um, we are a Hispanic serving institution. We are also a minority serving institution and we have the designation as an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution. We have three federal designations. 37% uh, of our students are Hispanic, 31% are black, and 16% are Asian, and we have a growing Asian population. We serve about 20,000 students, credit-bearing students, and about another nine, almost 10,000 students on the workforce development and continuing education side. Our students come from 155 different countries speaking 111 <laughs> languages and counting. <laughs> so we're close. Yes. <laughs> we're getting there. Um, you speak more than Google, though. <laughs> <laughs> we speak more than Google. We speak more than Googleese. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but you know the main takeaways um, are on the bottom half of the slide. We consider ourselves working hard as part of our mission to help our students get on the pathway out of poverty. Because you see approximately 70, actually more than 70% of our students, household income is $30,000 or less in the city of New York. We have students from all five boroughs. 70% of our students at the time that the pandemic hit two years ago, were either looking for work or lost their job as a direct result of the pandemic. So you talk about economic and social mobility, um, impacting communities, it hit us and it hit us hard. 50% of our students are, um, have indicated that they are uh, food insecure and about 18, almost 19% of our students are housing insecure or homeless. What we've learned um, is that our students have grit and determination. That in the face of adversity, um, they find a way to persevere and to persist. And it is our duty and our obligation and our honor to help our students succeed. Life happens. Right? But nothing like the pandemic have we seen before. I, I lived through the HIV AIDS pandemic back in the 80s. I actually was working in healthcare at that time. Um, I worked in healthcare for 25 years, um, was president of three hospitals. So I get it in terms of the impact. I actually have a master's in public health from Columbia University and a doctorate in health education. So I get it. And our communities were disproportionately impacted because of so many uh, systemic issues that are impacting our communities. We have an obligation to change that. So what did we do? We um, ensured that our students got information about uh, vaccines. We opened up the CUNY in the Heights location. We provided food uh, through our food pantry. We did a number of things that you can see on this slide. I'm not going to belabor because I know we're running over time, but most importantly um, is that we do what we do because of and on behalf of our students. That's you. And so whatever it is that we can do, and my good colleagues uh, 
know this because they do this each and every day, to help and support our students, we're here to do it. So thank you for this opportunity, thank you. Thank you so much, and we are running short on time, so I'm just gonna throw out a few questions for folks to answer, and not everyone needs to address them, but uh, this first question is for you, President De Filippis. Uh, I'm curious, um, the, the word racial justice has come up a couple of times, either in conversation or in the slide, and as leaders, all of you have to make decisions and had to make decisions during the pandemic. How did racial justice factor into that? What are the other core values that you use to guide your decision-making as a leader during the pandemic? Well, the first thing for me was to ensure that people were safe, that my students were safe, that my students were supported in every possible way, that there was a quality of support. We also uh, have to work with the um, uh, the uh, the mandates of the governor's office and 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 and, uh, and and the mayor's office, but within that, this latitude. So, for example, for me, this past semester that was a little tough because we were sort of we didn't know, and so it was the, we were expected to have 70, 30. So when the class schedules came in, uh, and and this is I mean I'm very. People know I'm very transparent. So, so the, when the class schedule came in, we stayed pretty close to that mandate of 70, 30, like 66, 68 in person. Mm -hmm. But what I committed, and I sort of closed my eyes a little bit, all right, which I, I think my, uh, uh, my, my vice president of administration, who's an old dear friend with whom I work well, she said, Daisy, it's only you, that's where you get away with this. Mm -hmm. I let them do class schedules that were very much broader than they would need. So ultimately, I figure the students will determine, you know, what classes better serve their purposes and during this pandemic. As it worked out, the classes that we had to cancel, because they all went to town in scheduling classes, right, uh, was, uh, uh, pretty much even. So we pretty much, ca we canceled 45% of the classes that had to be canceled were uh, online, so nobody could say they couldn't do the course because there was an opportunity online, and the other were in person. I also sort of said, okay, we're gonna bite the bullet here, and the classes, some of these classes that the students need for graduation will run with six students in it. And the truth be told, some had, and that was negotiated quietly with the chair and the provost, had five. Because, you know, and then the clinicals, because we have very strong Ally Health and, and uh, Ally Health and uh, uh, nursing programs, mm -hmm. some of those clinicals usually run at six to eight, they run four to six. So with that size class, that sometimes is expensive um, to run a class in that way, but you made those choices for online, for class size, in order to make sure that students had the access were, to things that they but needed. But in the end, you know, the way it worked out, because the one thing I knew, and this is the truth, okay, mm -hmm. I talk to the students regularly, I walk around. I walk around everywhere at, at the college. And Diana walks with me, so she knows my, my chief of staff, mm -hmm. and she takes notes, and, mm -hmm. and we try. And I, I used to do that always when I was a provost back at Austin, when I was over there in Connecticut, and when I was a dean at York, I used to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the students were craving to come back mm -hmm. because what happens is in the South Bronx, is really, really difficult for many to sustain the white kind of Wi-Fi that they do. Uh, mm -hmm. They are also, depend on the food pantry that we ran open five days a week. We also had uh, gift cards that they gave our student government. I always said, you watch the students behave and you learn. Because I got there in, 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 at the beginning of July of 2020. And the first meeting with the students, I found out that the student government had voted 
to use the extra money that they can have for parties or whatever they're going to do mm -hmm. to help all the students. To give so then I began to tell the stories to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I met with everybody in the world that was so I would tell the stories, and some of them would say to me, "Daisy, I'll give you twenty thousand, but not for not for you to decide. I want you to give it to the SGA to mm -hmm. distribute to the students." And I say, "Great, and you that's know? justice. Great. That's that's so, a type of economic so we justice." Find, we found because I knew what it meant for these students. They tell me I have. A, leaders in SGA and you know we talk and I try to help them and they're really like innocence they have such a good heart the students it's amazing and 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 and, and they say right now that they were they were at the school and they're all over you walk now even in the rain you see them outside going from one building to the other whatever they want to do it's just amazing and, and I, they, do want, I, I do want to jump in because I want to uh, get Miss Landa Verde in there as well to cool. to talk about this idea of racial justice um, if yes. you don't mind oh by the way mm -hmm. racial justice I'll throw that in okay mm -hmm. that we were one of the one of the reasons uh, the college has been recognized. It's not just me. I'm number eight permanent president there. But it, the college has a history of leadership where every president in their own way cared deeply about what it means. This school came out of the fight of the Puerto Rican community primarily, but others as well. The same thing. You had Jews, you had, Lati you had other Latino groups, you have blacks, everybody supporting the college. All right, and and over the years, this is this is this is why this past also this past summer we heard so many wonderful things. So, for example, all right, which surprised me, I didn't know that the National Clearinghouse 2021 said they look at Ostos on retention, and we put a lot of efforts in the first year in terms of intervening hands-on, making sure that that we facilitate many things. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that we get, and they say, also as compared to the average school of, you know, its size and, and community college nationwide, over a thousand. We do better than the average, which is we are 8% above the national average for that our group. For Latinx students, uh, six point something, for black students, and here I said, wow, because we have a growing influx of West African, Afro-Caribbeans, and you know, African-American students who feel really comfortable there, 17% mm -hmm. above the national average. Mm -hmm. All right? Now we have to work at the community colleges nationally with the men more so than the women, because right now 60% uh, of our population is female, single head of households, so we try to also get grants to help like our faculty got this wonderful grant for students, both men and women who have children uh, who are ages four to 14. This is called the Hope Project. It's an NSF grant that begins now in the summer that they will have, we will, the students can come and earn seven credits without using their bell or tap or anything. And mm -hmm. they, some of them can't in the summer. And those who don't get any because of whatever paperwork situation, they get seven credits that they can take. That's and, incredibly and important. And the four, fourteen. So, so let me just give you one last thing. One, 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 one last, last thing, thing. thing, and then Miss no, no, Landa ready to jump in. I was very surprised that we had we have we're going through beginning Sunday. All right, mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. Also, so, so. <laughs> is this our middle states uh, visit, which is going to be virtual, but we begin Sunday. The chair of the visiting team came to visit the college, a preliminary visit in November, sent me this incredible email about this, and that addresses <coughs> directly, but I gave you the background of all of the things. Right? He said, I am leaving this college in awe of your students, faculty, and administration, because nowhere have we heard articulated more so the case for being there being a huge commitment to equity and social justice. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing. When I just give you the example, the students voted themselves the money to go to help all the students who had even less. Think That's about incredibly that. important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, all President right. David. Okay. Okay. 
Ms. Landa Verde, you also talked in your presentation about racial justice as something that you centered in your decision making, but what are the other pieces of values that you centered for your decision making as a leader during the pandemic? I think for us it came down to equity, like how do we use the resources that we have in an equitable way and making sure, you know, like during the pandemic, a lot of our doors were, I mean, no surprise to nobody, like everybody saw the lines, everybody saw the wait times at our Elmer's hospital, but it was more about like giving the reassurance that even though you're waiting two or three hours, we will give you, you will be seen, you will be seen by our amazing doctors, you will be, get, you'll be given the care that you deserve, but at the same time, making sure that we have enough resources for everybody. And that was something we always made sure of, that everyone walking through our doors got the right access to healthcare. But going back to the students, I think something um, our presidents have said here from the colleges is it really starts with you. It starts with everyone here. You guys need to start talking about it and then create an action. You guys have more power than you think. Thank you. And, and we're going to all the sneezing. I'm allergic to something. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience in a, in a few minutes. Um, President Monroe, for you, in what ways do you think that we are stronger? This has been an incredibly challenging time, this pandemic. I would like to think that in some ways our experience has made <laughs> us stronger. In what ways do you think that we are stronger as a result of this experience? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I think this, this experience over the last 24, 25, 26 months has demonstrated uh, to us our, our deep, profound commitment to um, community, and that um, there is strength um, in working together and supporting each other, and that is something that has become a, a um, important theme at BMCC, that we are in this together. And while each of us have different experiences and are impacted in different ways, at the end of the day, if one um, group is impacted within our community, we all are. And so I think we, we've recognized the power of uh, breaking down the silos and building bridges um, and understanding that um, we are a community. Thank you. And this last question will be for President Wu. If you have a question that you would la like to ask from the audience, please feel free to approach one of the microphones on either side of the stage now. Um, and after President Wu speaks, you would be able to address um, the panel uh, as, as a whole or any individual with your question. So President Wu, question for you. What are the rituals of remembrance that you have been a part of or that you have seen in your communities that you believe are important or will be needed in the future? So what are the rituals of remembrance that you've seen or that you think we will need about the pandemic? That's a great question. You know, ritual is so powerful. If you're a person of faith, if you're in a community of faith, and even if you're not, if you have any opportunity to visit a house of worship, you, you see how ritual heals, how it brings us together, and, and how important it is to just engage in it constantly. You know, I, one of the words that sometimes young people use these days, you know, I, I can't keep up with all the uh, language change, is performative. And it, it usually, it's a pejorative, right? Uh, and it's deserved that way sometimes uh, because we have all seen so many leaders, corporate leaders especially, who tweet out something about how they're all in favor of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then one of their employees calls them out and says, wait a minute, your own practices in the company that you had don't reflect this at all. That's just performative, right? You know that it's good PR to say that, and so you're going to say that. But I want to respond to your question about ritual because some things are performative in a positive sense, right? Um, the rituals that we go through, and sometimes when you're young, sometimes when you, you for a moment, you're skeptical, you're doubting, you, you've lost your faith, 
for that moment, you might wonder uh, about that ritual that you're participating in, but then you realize that it connects you to a community. We're going to do something on this campus, and I want to thank students for, for this, the Yellow Hearts uh, Project, which is a national project. I think our students organizing this are among the youngest who are part of this. For those of you who don't know it, it's a national effort to commemorate those lost uh, to COVID-19. And it's a ritual in the positive sense, right? It's, it's something that we're going to do together in community because to do that, like when we commemorate 9-11 with the ringing of the bells of our clock tower, it's a way that we find solace with one another, that we seek comfort in community, and that is so important. So there are so many rituals and I believe in the power of this ritual, and I want to thank, I don't know if they're here today, but the students who are putting together the, the Yellow Heart uh, project, and we will have something on campus, so watch for the, the news of that. It, it is so important, and it's ongoing. You can't just do it once. You have to keep engaging cooperatively in community as challenges come up on our campus as they do anywhere else. So thank you. Thank you, and please thank the panel. So as we begin to come to a close, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, so last piece. Um, if anyone would like to make a call to action, what is next? Thinking about us as individuals, think about, about us as institutions, us as the United States. What is our responsibility as the pandemic continues to take action to bring it to a close and to support one another? So any final brief calls to action for us as individuals, as institutions, and as a nation? Whoever would like to state. Because we'll go in order. <laughs> um, I guess on the healthcare piece, you know, please fight the misinformation on vaccines. I think vaccines are super important, whether we're just talking about COVID-19, pandemic, or other preventable communicable diseases. Sadly, this won't be our last pandemic. With climate change and everything going on in our communities, this will not be the last thing we face. Um, so please fight the mis mis misinformation on vaccines. That's my call to action for you guys, so we can start our recovery and getting back to a better um, community and better environment. Thank you. Fight for quality, affordable education. When I mean that is that has that is accessible, accessible to all. So in in every community, what is the position on education? I know community colleges nationwide do the most quintessentially American transformative job, which is to move folks to the middle class, to, to, to either a good profession uh, uh, with, with a two-year degree or to, or to transfer opportunities. Many community colleges, both here and in Connecticut where I was in New York, because I just checked. When you have senior colleges like Queens College and you have commencement, at least half or more began as a transfer student from a community college because we do a great job of creating students with a mindset to, to learn the learning skills to be a student. So please, uh, the community colleges need your support. I, for every one of the, and I have met, but you can imagine how many politicians, elected officials. So finally, the Pell goes up $400. I wrote letters to everybody thanking them profusely, and then when I met them, like yesterday morning, I had a congressman in my office, in my visiting, and I have a list of things that I want to do with them, and uh, one of them, by the way, is a program I'm going to talk to Frank ooh, about a, the, that the arts administration to, to figure out, okay, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and just insist that they fund community colleges, that they don't continue to cut. Thank you, President okay. De Filippis. President Monroe, any final call to action? Continue to fight for equity and inclusion in very real ways, not the rhetoric, not the narrative, 
but in demonstrable, impactful ways that actually support and move our communities forward. Thank you. And finally, President Wu. Uh, I'd like to pull all this together and show how the individual connects to the community. So here's the truth of it. No single one of us in this room, doesn't matter how fancy our title, doesn't matter how much power we have, doesn't matter how old we are, what our race, what our ethnicity, what our faith is, it doesn't matter what our gender, sexual orientation, or politics are, no one of us is going to end the pandemic. No one of us is going to stop climate change, right? That takes all of us. These are public issues, collective action issues. So they require public response, collective action response. But don't misunderstand. Every individual has a role to play. And I'm going to give you a very concrete way to think about this. It doesn't matter what I think about vaccines. It doesn't matter what I think about climate change to your parents or grandparents or your cousins. I'm not going to be able to persuade them. And I'm trained as a lawyer. I'm pretty good at this. But I know I'm not going to be able to persuade them. But you can. That's what's so important. Each individual can mobilize the community. So even though addressing the pandemic or climate change or whatever other big issue, and there's so many big issues that we face, sometimes in my role I think there's a crisis every day, but then I turn on the TV and I realize out there in the world there's so much going on. There's war going on right now. Right? No one of us can stop that either. But every one of us can reach out to our grandparents, our parents, our cousins, those who maybe they watch a little too much of whatever TikTok uh, super user or influencer or whatever TV channel. They've, they've gotten a misunderstanding about the world. And that person, they're not going to listen to me, but they'll listen to you. So go out there and persuade the people that we need to win over to address the pandemic and climate change and racial justice and everything else. Because every one of us, picture who this is, every one of us has got a cousin who isn't with us on this. Mm -hmm. Talk to your cousin. Thanks. Thank you. So as we conclude, we heard, fight misinformation, fight for equality in education, fight for equity and inclusion, and every individual has a role to play, students in particular. Thank the panel, and I will pass it to Zayden. And thank you to the wonderful moderator. Thank you so much, panelists, moderator. We are... Um, Incredibly, thank you for um, speaking today. We've le learned a lot, and we're ready to take action. So thank you for making the trip and spending your time. We know you're really busy, all of, all of you. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, our next panel is the Queens College faculty panel. And uh, our moderator is um, Pierre, Francois Pierre Louis. Thank you, Zidia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again. Um, this is really um, such a pleasure and an honor to um, moderate this August panel with all the um, eminent faculty members from Queens College on the campus. We have a very distinguished panel with, um, you know, as you know, many of our, all of the faculty members have been working on um, COVID-19 and how it has affected our community in Queens and how we are managing post-COVID. You all have the um, copies of their bio and the, the, their work, and all the copies, I, I believe, is, uh, are available for you to read the, 
about the, the bio and also the work that they're working on. We are going to um, introduce, um, let the panelists speak, but they will have like three minutes for their talk and then there'll be questions afterward. Yeah, as you know, it's a, we have uh, six panelists, so if we have three minutes and then questions, I'll ask questions afterward. So we'll have enough time to, for the um, participants to ask uh, questions. So without further ado, let me introduce Professor Noria Rodriguez, planners, who will speak on the economic challenges of COVID-19. Yes. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the work I'm going to present today and the results I'm going to present today have been um, funded by uh, generous grants from the Russell Sage Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and CUNY Interdisciplinary Research Grant. And um, when this began, when the pandemic began, I thought, how can I help? And I thought maybe what I can do is what I know how to do best, which is to collect data and analyze it. And in particular, what I wanted to do is understand how Queens College students were coping with the pandemic, what challenges they were having, so I could provide evidence-based results and findings so the administrators could have better information on how to provide good services uh, so that uh, your challenges uh, were mitigated. So I'm going to answer three questions. The first one is, what were the challenges of Queens College students during the spring and summer 2020? Then I'm going to ask what happened to the spring 2020 GPA and what's the role of flexible grading in helping uh, that GPA you know, to sustain, increase, or at least not drop. So uh, the first question is now, uh, the results are now coming uh, in, in a paper that will come up next week, uh, next month, in uh, the Economics Education Review. So basically, um, the data, so as soon as it started, I asked permission to collect data from Queens College students. I developed a survey and got this permission, and at the end of summer 2020, every single school student enrolled at Queens College received this survey and had several months to respond it. 3,200 students uh, responded, and uh, all the questions are in relationship to before the pandemic, what are your challenges right now? Or because of the pandemic, how are you coping right now? So any of the results are before, after comparisons for a particular student, okay? Um, so what we find is, what I find is that COVID um, implied important disruptions for Queens College students at the educational level. In particular, because of the pandemic, between 14 and 34% of the students considered dropping a class during spring 2020. 30% of the students at Queens College, because of the pandemic, changed their graduation plans, and the freshman retention uh, fell by 26% uh, because of the pandemic. The students also were hard hit economically and financially. Because of the pandemic, 40% of the students lost their jobs, 35% of them reported learn, learn, uh, losing earnings, and 64% of them anticipated that their household income would decrease because of the pandemic. Not surprisingly, Pell recipients, first generation students and transfer students were hard hit, hard, were harder hit by the pandemic. So what about grades? What happened to grades? And these, these, these results are also published uh, this last month. So to do this, basically I'm looking at the same students that responded to the survey, but this time I'm looking at their academic records, but going back to spring 2017 or whenever they started at Queens College. I also access transcript data for spring 2020, so I'm able to find out what would the spring 2020 GPA had been in the absence of flexible grading. So the first result is that the spring semester GPA increased um, so there was great inflation, grades went up. Uh, so for, for instance, for non-Pell recipients, the increase in the GPA was 13%. Uh, and this is for an individual relative to his own GPAs, his own grades before the pandemic. So an average of an, an individual who had a 3.0 in fall 2019 will now have a 3.4 in spring 2020. So that's how much the grades increase. 
Importantly, how much of that change is explained by flexible grading? About 40%. So the 3.0 student without the flexible grading would have ended up with a 3.23 GPA. Another thing that I looked at were Pell recipients, our most vulnerable students, harder hit by this pandemic in terms of grades? And the answer, surprisingly, is no. Actually, their grades increased by 5% relative to non-PEL recipients during spring semester 2020. And the reason is that they use strategically the flexible grading to get a higher boost in their GPA. So the 3.0 student um, in fall 2019, uh, who was a PEL recipient, ended up with a 3.56 GPA in spring 2020. In the absence of flexible grading, his GPA would have been exactly the same than the non-PEL recipient 3.23. So let me very briefly tell you what interventions are helping CUNY students cope with the COVID challenges. I've studied two of them. One is a lottery-based $500 Chancellor's Emergency Relief Grant that the Chancellor gave to very vulnerable CUNY students. These are low income, with dependents, and undocumented students. There was not enough money for everybody. It was distributed by lottery, which means that I can compare students that look exactly alike, but some of them you know, did not get the lottery because they were unlucky. So, and when I do that, what I find is that this lottery was extremely successful. If it was given a month before the end of the spring semester, and to students close to finishing the degree, which most of these grants were given to these type of students, it increased graduation of those seeking an associate degree by 7%. And importantly, it also increased enrollment of these students who were seeking a, a, an associate degree and who graduated into a bachelor's degree program at CUNY by 16%. So this is a very, very um, efficient way of spending the money. And then the last intervention that I would like to talk about is uh, resilience thinking workshops. We are uh, organizing several resilience thinking workshops, and this is basically teaching the students how to understand their challenges and their role of change and capacity of change within the community, giving them agency and empowerment. And these workshops are um, led by Professor uh, Rafael de Valenzoju, who is one of the experts worldwide doing resilience thinking. So we've already done five of these workshops in, um, at Queens College. The one in the fall, we have analyzed the data, and we found that it increased resilience by 9% relative to the pre-workshop level a month earlier of resilience of these students. So if these results hold, these are very, very powerful results, and they relate and speak very much to what President uh, Frank Wu was talking about, about understanding that you, students, have the power to change. And you have a lot of power to, once you understand your power, you can bring it to the community and bring change to the community. And that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite Professor Belfield to come. And Professor Belfield studies the economic outcomes from education and undertakes evaluations of educational interventions that range from those that increase preschool enrollment to those that increase college completion rates. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, when Zadia invited me to speak on this, she gave me this long title, uh, which basically covers everything about the pandemic. So I'm gonna go through just some general, general thoughts of economists and general topics um, on uh, the pandemic and that title. I'm gonna throw in a little bit more talk about education. Now, for those of you who are not economists, most people think economists are kind of depressing, boring people. Don't answer that. But actually, economists are pretty optimistic about economies. They think of them as broad, not, uh, not receiving shocks, but pretty shock absorbent. That is to say, when a shock comes in, the economy takes the shock and rebounds pretty quickly, surprisingly quickly. And uh, there are lots of reasons for that. I put up some little icons there. Economies are typically growing things, so when a shock hits them, it's, it just slows them down a little bit. There's a lot of teamwork in economies. There's a lot of different sectors, a lot of innovation. And the big thing about economy, certainly developed economies, Western economies, uh, is uh, the level of human capital that people have. And it's very hard for shocks, pandemic shocks, economic shocks, to destroy human capital, the skills you guys have 
in your work jobs. I couldn't think of a good emoji for that, so I put a cup of coffee as the emoji that stands for human capital, your skills. And the pandemic did some things to skills, but it didn't do that much to the skills of workers in the economy and uh, people in the economy, not just at work. So when, when economists think about shocks, they think about the immediate shock and then the consequences of that shock. And there's a, a lot of literature on how uh, disadvantaged communities get more shocks and they also the shocks that they get are stronger shocks, they're harder shocks. So you can think of somebody who gets uh, lives near a, uh, a polluted a bus depot, you get that shock, you get asthma, then you get to school and the school doesn't have a nurse, so then the situation gets worse. So that's how economists think about shocks in a general way. And COVID was a very strange shock. It was a shock that we had never really seen before because it shocked three things. It shocked health and the healthcare sector, which is not normal. Sometimes uh, recessions are not too bad for people's health, not too bad on average. It shocked the health sector. It shocked work and work technology, your jobs and my job, everybody's job, and how that job was done. And then the other thing which the pandemic did, which was different, is it shocked education. Normally, the best way to deal with a recession is to go back to school. If you can't get a job, go to school, get some skills, and then when the economy is better, is better you can get a better job. It, this was a very strange shock in that it affected both uh, education, as Nouria has said, but also the job market. It affected the two things at the same time, and that made it a particularly powerful shock for our uh, economy and society, not just the economy, but also the society. So, um, on the health side, I've, I've put up a few numbers here uh, by race ethnicity groups. Uh, the, the numbers are not so important as much as the gaps. And uh, uh, this is census data. I had to group the AOC does not stand for our uh, phenomenal uh, member of Congress. It stands for other ethnic groups alone or in combination. Um, so uh, you can see there that uh, there were differences in COVID diagnoses. This is at New York City data. The differences in diagnoses, but not huge differences in diagnoses, but much lower rates for all groups if they had a four-year college degree. So you can see there that uh, the, the impact, the incidence of COVID is, is lower for persons with college degrees. It's lower for persons with um, uh, for uh, white groups versus um, uh, Hispanic, black, and alone in combination groups. Um, now, uh, the incidence of COVID is not a great test for, for uh, how the economy works because it was just a straightforward uh, shock to everybody. What is more uh, important is the access to healthcare and the vaccination, the responses of people to the COVID shock. And here you can see that there are differences in vaccination rates um, by uh, race ethnicity, but there's also a big impact of college. If you look at college, college persons with a college degree, much more likely to be vaccinated regardless of background. Um, and that's a big factor in making the economy resilient is persons with more skills are, more res are better able to respond to um, the pandemic. So that's the health side. On the economic side, um, the pandemic was a, a particular type of shock. It was a general shock in one sense, but it had a very strange set of features in that it was a general shock, but it seemed to be very, very much targeted to particular groups in terms of the hardship it imposed. So here you can see over the early period of the pandemic, the economic hardship by race ethnicity and you can see much higher rates uh, for uh, black Hispanic um, New York City residents than um, uh, white residents, almost double the rate of economic hardship. Uh, when we look at the pandemic and how it affected work, we see a, a pretty, striking, uh, pretty striking effect of the pandemic. Now, it's easiest to see in terms of 
uh, the wage levels of workers, the wage levels of workers, rather than skills or um, ethnicity. So I'm going to put this up. This is employment, and we're going to say it's January 2020. Let's just put everybody at zero, whether you're a high-wage worker, a low-wage worker, or a medium-wage worker, and let's see what happens to your employment rates as the pandemic courses along. And strikingly, if you were a high-wage worker, in terms of your job, the pandemic was pretty much over within within eight months. If you were a high if you were a high wage worker, you can see that red line there. Employment had gone up by 10% within the space of uh, 16 months. If you were a low wage worker, you can see that employment you lost your job. Big time lost job losses, and those job losses were not recovered for a long time. That was a big change to the labor market, and one that we're still trying to figure out how to get through. Now, uh, for those of you who are thinking about getting into the labor market, you want to try to be in the in uh, sectors where the um, employment is growing. In the pandemic, there were two types of job characteristics that affected um, whether you were going to lose your job and struggle to get a new one, or whether you were just going to be a temporary job loss and then go straight back to being rehired. And the two characteristics were, could your job be done at home or flexibly? If your job could be done at home or flexibly, the pandemic in terms of work was not too onerous. Could your job be done at home or flexibly? The other part was, did your job involve working with, with people or without people? And if it involved working with people, you were going to be in the struggling group. If it involved working by, not by yourself, but with limited contact with other people, then um, you were going to be okay in the pandemic. So that changed the nature of the world of work. And um, this may be a permanent change, that we're all going to be working at home much more than we were before. So that could be a, a big change from the pandemic. Now, Nuri has talked a lot about college. The main feature here was that college was supposed to act as a buffer for economic shocks, and it couldn't do that this time around, which is why college kind of got a lot of pressure and had difficulty dealing with it. And you can see differences in cancellation rates for uh, college courses over the early part of the pandemic. So, um, just to finish off, uh, Nuria mentioned resilience. Resilience is a big feature of what we're trying to get from a shock because you want the shock and then you want to be able to rebound. You want to be almost like an economy yourself with the kind of features that economies have. And we can see that there was quite a bit of resilience across groups that um, uh, was stable feelings of anxiety and then as as some of the uh, vaccination data came through and public uh, programs came through, anxiety has gone down quite a bit since the start of the pandemic, and it doesn't appear to have a lot of gaps by race ethnicity. That was fast. A lot of, a lot of slides, a lot of data. So I'll just summarize. These are shocks. If we knew the shock was coming, it wouldn't be a shock. Shocks are hard to plan for. In this case, we've got a shock that had so many different effects, so many persistent effects, and multidimensional compounding effects on each of them. Most of these, it's pretty clear, were harder for disadvantaged communities, depending on how one defines disadvantage. But on the plus side, our economic and social systems plus, for those of you who are getting college credits, those were serving as shock absorbers to some extent. They could have been done a better job, but they did do some role as shock absorbers for getting us out of the pandemic uh, as, an, as an economy, as a society. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we'll have a chance to come back to you again uh, after the um, panelists have presented their uh, uh, you know, presenting their, their work. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Lemut Gibson, and uh, he works on applied behavioral analysis and special education research design. So that's what I 
just summarize. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this. Um, I feel honored. Uh, a little bit about me, I work in uh, the graduate programs for special education, um, associate professor, and very happy to be here and uh, to be at Queens College. I am a first and only person in my family to uh, go to college, to, to get undergrad, then master's and then PhD, I kept going. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so I know, I, I, I know what it feels like, that, that struggle, that um, somewhat self-doubt. You know, you're, you're in a room and you're like, should I be here? And you should. So always, always for this, this is for the students, like always remember that. Whatever room you're in, you should be there. And uh, just, just push, just push. Um, so anyway, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about special education because that's my expertise. I teach in a special ed program. Um, and, and education in general had, a, you know, a COVID impacted it largely. I mean, nobody expected this, right? Nobody expected um, for schools to shut down. But when the pandemic started, pretty, pretty quickly after, uh, by April, beginning of April, all New York City schools uh, went online. And teachers didn't know what to do. As a teacher and as an educator of teachers, I saw the panic. I felt the panic. It was the panic. My wife is also a teacher and she felt and saw and was the panic, uh, the pandemic panic, because what do we do? We're used to being in front of uh, students. We're used to being in front of children and teaching them face to face. The, the slides are gonna say something and I'll say something else. This is what you get when you invite professors to, to talk. Um, one thing that really was evident to me early on is that students who had, uh, who were identified, who were identified as having disabilities or had IEPs were going to suffer more than anyone else, any other student, because they learn differently. They need a lot of that face-to-face -face interaction. They need more of that one-to-one -one time. They need um, the extra um, attention to detail um, I'm not saying that all students don't need that because all students do need that, but students who have, uh, who have identified disability, who have an IEP, um, it's an individualized education plan if you don't know what IEP stands for. So moving from an in-person um, you know, classroom environment, and a lot of students who, uh, who have IEPs are in you know, small classrooms, right? Maybe like six or 12 other students, to now um, doing things remotely, was going to be and was a huge challenge. Um, as you can kind of see from some of the statistics that I, I found, um, you know, uh, through the through last school year, 2020 and 2021, um, the vast majority of students um, with special needs, uh, with, uh, with disabilities, 80% were doing hybrid or um, remote, and only 6% did in-person in -person learning. Um, similar numbers for English language learners, similar numbers for economically disadvantaged students. Um, some, this, this move to remote, this move to online learning for these students caused huge disruptions. Um, just some numbers that I found. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of students who have IEPs in New York. Ha almost half of those students in New York State are, are educated in New York City um, the Department of Education Public Schools. So it's a lot of students. We're not talking about a, a small handful of students here. We're talking about a lot of students. Um, from the start of the pandemic, from the start of the shutdown uh, through November of 2020, 46% of, of special ed students in New York City were not receiving full services as outlined on their individual education plan. Now, that's a lot of services that they were missing out on. And there's, there's reasons for that. Um, remote learning reduced the effectiveness of special education services provided, and it substantially um, impacted the quality of those services for some reasons. We know for especially black and brown students um, who also may be living in areas where, uh, you know, they're economically disadvantaged, there's access to technology issues. You all might have had some issues around access to technology issues, right? If you're not fluent with technology, moving, maybe all of you are, because a lot of you are younger. A lot of you, you guys know technology. I'm, I'm pretty good, I, I, I think I'm pretty good with technology, but, I still, to this day, forget to unmute myself when I'm doing a Zoom. 
talking, talking, talking. People are like, what, is he, what are you saying, right? Um, now think about it from the perspective of parents who may not necessarily have access to good technology. I'm not talking about just um, you know, hardware because we know there's hardware issues, right? We know there's issues with laptops and issues getting, you know, getting access to you know, iPads and all the stuff that we're so used to. But what about high quality internet? You know, think about how students need to learn. Now you have teachers, and I know I did this, right? I saw my wife do it from home. I had my own small kids who I, they, you know, I was able to navigate trying to work and trying to teach them and everything else, and it's really, really hard. It requires a lot of attention, and my students, my children um, don't have IEPs. And it was really hard for me to make sure I'm trying to keep them on, in, on task as the teacher, and I'm a teacher. So for, for, for parents of students who, um, who, have, uh, you know, who have special needs, who learn differently, who need more attention, it becomes really, 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 really difficult, right? Um, we all know and we've heard many times from all the, all the panelists before and probably the panelists after is that Black and Latinx communities were disproportionately impacted by, by the pandemic in many different ways, right? A lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of us lost family. I know we did, I know I did, I know my family lost family, right? And how do we you know, then wrap our heads around also trying to keep our, our children educated when we're losing people left and right, right? A lot of, a lot of us uh, were essential workers. We didn't have the luxury of staying at home and making sure that our kids were sitting in front of a computer to learn you know, through this medium. Right, so the, all of those things are true and all of those things happen, which impacted the way the students who have special needs and who had IEPs learned since the beginning of the pandemic until now. <clears throat> just, some, just a couple of you know, slides here with some um, lost learning opportunities, obviously disproportionately affecting black and Latinx students in special ed, right? So you see, you know, starting in, starting in November when they started looking at the, some of the numbers, 37% um, of students weren't receiving full services. They were only receiving partial services. It improved, it improved by January of last year, uh, you know, 20% of special ed students weren't receiving um, special education services. And you also see related services. So if you don't know what related services are, there are things like uh, speech and language you know, services. There, there are things like occupational therapy, additional therapies that students who have IEPs need in order to um, you know, really learn better. And they weren't receiving those services. The impact of that is that you don't just catch up. You fall, they, they fall further and further behind. And they're still trying to figure out ways to catch up. Um, so how do we address the needs, right? Teachers in particular weren't prepared. I kind of told you my little antidote, my own house and me not being prepared to help my children also learn remotely. Well, the teachers are the ones who were charged with, here you go, we're moving to remote, figure it out. Oh yeah, there was a couple trainings, by the way, to help with that, right? Um, I give teachers so much credit here because they learned, they learned quickly, but sometimes we still didn't have the type of resources and supports that we needed to really make that, that you know, impact, right? And we know that this had an impact on academic achievement for students who have special needs. Um, and we also know, and this is a big thing that I don't think we're going to feel the effects of for, for still years to come, is that referrals for students who might need special, uh, some special education services were down from the beginning of the pandemic. 50, 57% down from pre-pandemic levels. Uh, another another statistic, that, statistic that stuck out to me is that 66% of black students were not being referred. I'm almost done. <clears throat> that is, what that means is that these students were not able to then be identified as of needing special, need, special education services and then therefore not getting that, right? Young, young children, by the way, like we're talking about like, like three, four years old, and they're not going to be on a trajectory now to get the services that they need, so that's really important. Um, there, some of the unknown impact is the impact on social learning. A lot of students who have special needs need more socialization. 
And if they're not there in person, which they weren't, how are they getting that? I work a lot with um, children who have autism spectrum disorder. One of the key features of autism spectrum disorder is lack of, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's this, this, this issue around socializing. We don't even know, and, and not, we're not even touching on the, the emotional and mental health aspect of um, the pandemic had on students who probably already having this issue of being able to process their own, you know, emotions and feelings on top of, you know, the, the, the terror that they see in their own, in their own families and losing people. So um, it's pretty, it's, it, it, it had a big impact. Um, so recommendations that I give to my students and my classes are, let's establish, let's reestablish the rapport with the families. Right, it's such, it's such an important thing that I think that uh, you know people just think, oh well, you know, you're a teacher, you reach out to the families, and, and they're going to be receptive. Well, families are going through a lot. Our families in our communities are going through a lot, so we need to make sure that we're um, establishing that rapport. In addition, uh, making sure that we're assessing this, the, this, the needs of these of our students, their their academic needs, of course, but their social needs and their emotional needs. And the biggest the biggest thing that I can recommend to my my students in my class now is being empathetic understanding that communities di experienced um, the pandemic differently, and then therefore that translated to how their children also were educated during that time. And if we're not empathetic to that, and we can't try to understand that, then we're not gonna be able to establish that rapport. Um, I think Black and Latinx students with special needs were the most impacted by this pandemic. Oh, one more thing that I, that's not on here is come join us. Like, right, like, let's become teachers, become special ed teachers. We need you to be in the classroom to educate ourselves, our own children. So that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gray Nicholas to come in and uh, speak on, uh, I believe it's on the, uh, her research is on the uh, college access and college readiness and persistence of traditionally marginalized um, uh, students, experience of black and women in academia, right? Okay. Oh, you'll be speaking from here. Okay, good enough. Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nakia Gray Nicholas. I am an assistant professor of educational leadership, um, which is essentially preparing teachers to be school building leaders and then in the future school district leaders. A little bit about myself I am the proud daughter of Caribbean immigrants. My mom is from Jamaica, my father's from Trinidad, um, and I am a first generation student as well. Actually, in the School of Education, we have a FIGSI, which is the um, First Generation Scholars Initiative that we hope to be expanding to support our first generation students in the College of Ed. If you'll allow me, I want to talk about this question of um, the impact of COVID on Black, Latinx, and Caribbean students um, by talking about it in my field of educational leadership. Um, and then after that, I'll talk about it a bit about my own practice as a teacher, um, as a professor, preparing the next generation of school building leaders. So school leaders, district leaders and building leaders, are the managerial and instructional leaders of our districts and our school. And with that responsibility, when the shelter in place orders came about in March 2020, they had to quickly pivot and move learning to a remote platform, right? Learning for their students, but not just for their students, for their teachers, for their staff. How do they support all in their school building and also in their community for this? Some statistics around that, um, in that initial school year, approximately in the 2020, 2021 school year, 67% um, of all US schools were still virtual. So after that initial push for virtual. Students um, ha who had internet access um, or, or did not have internet access, school leaders were charged with providing that for students, providing devices, providing access. Um, and still 4% 4 of schools said they were able to 
purchase internet access for their students. This is nationally. Um, this is just some of the statistics from the National Center of Education Statistics. 59% um, of schools provided devices. Um, and even with those schools providing access to devices and access to internet, we still see for our most vulnerable populations that that access wasn't enough. They were kind of forced to share the devices with younger siblings or older siblings or parents. Um, and as mentioned from the other panelists, high quality internet was not there. Um, I don't know if you all remember some of the photos of students sitting outside of fast food restaurants because they did not have internet access at home or waiting until after their parents' um, work day to get onto the internet and do their schoolwork then. So this is what our educational leaders were facing. How do we support these vulnerable populations of students and our most vulnerable population of traditionally marginalized students? And also, how do we support our teachers? And in an article by Grooms and Child, they interviewed 33 school principals across the country and asked them that very question. What was your sense making around the pivoting to virtual learning? Um, what was your sense making around the aftermath of this initial switch to school, initial um, switch to virtual learning? And overall, these principals spoke about supporting with care, making the personal first acknowledging that we are all humans and that we're all dealing with this trauma of having to switch from in-person to virtual learning and dealing with the pandemic. As mentioned, students lost uh, people, teachers lost people, pre principals lost people. Um, my own students spoke about the loss of their parents and in some regards, the loss of their school building leader to COVID. They had to develop new organizational routines, um, and they also had to deal with the societal impact of not just the pandemic, but of racial unrest um, with all of the many things that we had to witness on social media and on TV from, as um, President Wu mentioned, um, essentially state-sanctioned murder and beyond. So... Not only were our school leaders dealing with supporting students and staff with that, these vulnerable populations were dealing with it daily. Um, and I just wanted to kind of switch from talking about the stats to talking about the impact I saw in my, my own students and in myself. <clears throat> with this switch to virtual teaching and virtual learning, we all had to learn new things, myself included. Thankfully, Queens College provided um, certain workshops and platforms, um, but I felt it was not only my responsibility to educate my students on the curriculum in our program, educational leadership, but also how to teach on this platform. So I myself was a classroom teacher. I taught middle school, and I always see myself at my core as a teacher. Um, so I ensured that my own practice reflected things that they can do in their classroom. I talked and worked with my students to kind of ensure that they were recognizing their students as people and not just numbers. So how do we deal with a population of students who um, are dealing or going through trauma? How do we incorporate trauma-informed and restorative practices in our everyday teaching lives. Um, and with that, one of the things I, I mainly switched in my teaching practice, um, at the start of every class, I used to do major headlines. And I would ask my students to talk about what's happening in the world. But as you can imagine, over the last two years, what's happening in the world is a trigger, and it re-triggered the trauma that they were all experiencing. So I shifted from that, um, and I started to, um, I brought a quote. Every class, I opened with a quote. Um, I actually started with the quotes around Powder Maker. Um, if you haven't taken a look at Powder Maker, there are some powerful quotes around and inside of the building. And then from there, I kind of let the class uh, content for that day guide me on the quote. And I asked my students at the top of the class, what does this quote mean to you? And what does it mean for our practice as future leaders and even our practice now as teachers? And it gave our, my students an opportunity to reflect on what they were doing, um, reflect on how they were doing it, and furthermore, to reflect on what they can do in the future to support themselves and their students. 
Um, so as I mentioned, I wanted to talk about this briefly because we had a lot of great statistics earlier and a lot of great information earlier about how um, the pandemic has kind of flipped education on its head and flipped learning on its head. Um, I want to just end with my charge to you all as students, as faculty in the room, um, to remember that we are all going through this very hard human experience together and to constantly extend grace to each other and more importantly to yourselves. Um, we kind of find that in this we still need to keep up, right? We still need to do what we have to do. But one thing I've learned in this space today um, from my wonderful esteemed panelists um, and just being in this you know, two years of of COVID and we're not completely out of the woods yet, is that the work will get done, um, but the personal should come first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Andre Nicolas. Now we move on to Dr. Cindy Placido. Her, works, uh, her work examines social movements in the Americas for a special focus on the contributions of women and people of African and Caribbean descent. Hi, everyone. I guess I'll sit as well. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much to everyone who put the event together. Um, Dr. Zaria Feliciano, who has been in touch with me over email over several months um, for the invitation. And then, of course, to my fellow panelists and also the performers. I'm pretty excited about the performance later today. Um, so I'm really, this is such a special day. I think it is such a reflection of the community that we have here at Queens College. I feel so privileged that every semester I indeed have black, Latinx, and Caribbean students in my class as someone who's a historian and teaches Caribbean history. I also teach the history of Caribbean peoples in other parts of the Americas, namely the United States, and kind of these interactions uh, that different groups are having historically um, with a focus on women, again, and on African descent people. So I'm also a Dominican first-generation student, uh, first in my family to get a PhD and I'm from the Bronx and it's again it's such a huge honor that I get to kind of be here and um, teach these subjects um, to the the beautiful population that's here at Queens College so um, again we heard so many great statistics about the impact of COVID-19 on black Latinx Caribbean and other communities in NYC I'm glad you all helped me because one of the points was that um, we know that these communities were disproportionate proportionately impacted in our city. In New York City in particular, we know that the Latinx community was hit very hard, and I think that's like a really key, I think we even saw in the statistics today the ways in which um, what are called uh, at times either Hispanic or Latinx uh, communities, right, actually led in terms of the numbers of infection and the numbers of deaths. Um, and so this, to me, is such an important indication of how much of our city's dangerous essential work is done by Latinx people, by migrant workers, right? Um, you know, and again, if you know anything about the Latinx population here in New York City, you know that it's very much an Afro-Latinx population, peoples who could and should be more carefully considered as part of the black population as well. And then when you go into the black population, that needs to be desegregated as well, because within that population, we have US-born black people, black migrants from all over the world, Africa, the Caribbean, the rest of Latin America. So, you know, I think all of these statistics are so excellent. And I think that's what I appreciate about history is that sometimes through history, you can get at some of these nuances that the statistics are still essential. We need them for the policy, for the lawmaking, et cetera. But I think it's, it's also really generous when we take some time to pay attention to the ways in which the categories document as much as they obscure, right? And history, and given the types of histories I teach, I'm always letting people in my class know, you know, we need to pay attention to what's visible, but also paying a lot of attention to what's not there, what's not visible, to what's obscured, is it can be as 
uh, informational generative, right? So what about, you know, people who may simultaneously identify or be identified as black, Latinx, and Caribbean, right? As is the case with many of the people that I teach about in my classes, people from Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, right? These are groups with large populations within New York and the Northeastern U.S. in general. And so it's extremely important to use specificity when discussing topics such as public health, since these questions of nationality, race, class, citizenship, and their intersectionality, right, in terms of how they kind of produce new meanings are key to understanding the nuances of how this pandemic has affected communities in New York City. So um, I also wear a hat. I work as a researcher at the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute, which is a really great research institute based at City College. and. That research institute uh, produces all types of studies periodically, and I, I wasn't part of this study, but some of my colleagues there, including the director, Ramon Hernandez, and then other, um, actually a member of the medical school at City College was involved in this study. They actually did a study on um, the way COVID, specifically this question, how can we look at COVID-19 specifically within the Dominican community? So they did a survey in late 2021, 795. Dominican adults from New York, New Jersey, Florida, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, which are states with very high Dominican uh, populations. And, you know, I, I was looking at some of the statistics. They do align with some of what I saw my colleagues mention. 24% of respondents reported having gotten COVID, 77% had been vaccinated, 79% responded that they were almost always wearing the mask indoors during the first wave. And um, I think one of the things that CUNY DSI was pointing out with the Dominican example was number one, they felt that those were very high vaccination rates when you compare to other Latinx groups. So again, this can be some of the ways for those of you who are in the room who might be in the social sciences or the humanities, these are the types of research that now you can build on, right? Uh, all of these wonderful faculty members here. You know, you have a role as well in building upon these studies and finding additional details. They were finding interesting differences and nuances between US born versus DR born population. So that's gonna be something for those of you doing future research to think about. And they also were asking questions about mental health and the, they got a result of 52% of those uh, surveyed actually were reporting high rates of anxiety. So I, um, you know, that's one of the points that I think for me as an educator, I'm very attentive to here at Queens College with my students as I was teaching online in, in 2020 and 2021. I think the issue of mental health has to be taken so extremely seriously, right? Because this was a disruptive, uh, two year period disruptive with all manner of shocks, right? That affected people not only in terms of their health, but also their economics and then their social experiences and milestones. I really do feel for that kind kind of uh, generation that maybe didn't get to have their high school graduation or whatever, you know, and I think that's the social aspects of how this has affected people, I think is so real. You know, online learning, you know, has its pros, in fact. There are some things I like about online learning, but there, I, I personally wonder as a historian, like how will these um, effects manifest in the future, especially with your um, talk I was thinking a lot about for a special need students, you know, I think that's going to be a really interesting slash extremely important thing to track over time. How is it that the lack of uh, support and access early in their educational careers, how do you see that manifesting 10, 15 years down the line? I think that some, some of you who go into the fields of education might see some of those results in the future. So, you know, the things I'm very attentive to as a faculty member is definitely thinking about how are students dealing with these things like tuition, access to safe food, housing, transportation. It's great to see all the different CUNY campuses and some of the services that they provided, but I know, you know, it doesn't reach everyone, and I think sometimes it's because maybe those things exist, but there can sometimes be a gap between the service existing and maybe the student taking the step to say, I'm gonna go, and access these resources. So that's, uh, I guess, you know, one thing I wanna do just with the last few minutes is um, kind of bringing up some historical examples. That's what I do of how, you know, kind of spaces like the university, what I wrote here was like how it can be a vehicle for helping all of us articulate and acquire the support we need, right? So how can this space, like all of us here, 
with just so much intelligence, expertise, experience, right? How can we actually work together to use the university as an actual space within which we have these conversations where we articulate needs, demands, and then we create action plans, right? So, you know, the one, one example I have is the Young Lords. I used, I used this book um, a lot when I was teaching online in 2021. Joanna Fernandez, who wrote the book, is a CUNY professor. She teaches at Baruch. She's amazing. Um, she's actually Dominican herself, Afro-Dominican. And then she wrote this. Uh, this is kind of the definitive history of the Young Lords. It was actually published in the midst of the pandemic. It was published in 2020. One thing some folks might not know about the Young Lords, a lot of people might know of the Young Lords in terms of, oh, they're the Puerto Rican version of the Black Panthers. <laughs> but one of the very important thing that both the Black Panthers and the Young Lords did was some of their earliest campaigns and interventions were around public health. So folks might not know tuberculosis, which is another respiratory disease, was one of the earliest things they were working on. They were doing kind of, um, I realize I probably only have a couple minutes, kind of going door to door. Um, uh, work, you know, they were in East Harlem where, of course, high rates of, um, yeah, what do we have, two minutes um, of, one minute, okay, so high rates of tuberculosis <laughs> in places like East Harlem in the South Bronx, and that was one of the things that the Young Lords did early on. One of the other things they did is that they worked with pre-existing organizing, like at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, where you had mental health counselors, janitorial staff, administrators. They went on strike in the spring of 1969 with the assistance of the Black Panthers, and then that summer, the Young Lords came in, and within that kind of mix, they actually took over, I'm not, I'm not saying we need to necessarily, but I think the example here is that by taking over one of the uh, uh, floors in Lincoln Hospital, they created an innovative drug detox program that used acupuncture. This is all in 1970. They then later took over Lincoln Hospital. But throughout all of that, they were constantly collaborating with local residents, doctors, and then the people within the institution, the exactly workers etc so you know in my own research in the Caribbean um, there are so many examples of Caribbean women who are also very attentive to the themes of community and social medicine people such as Evangelina Rodriguez who I study who was the first woman doctor in the Dominican Republic who was also a black woman in the early 20th century and she did a lot of important work for example during the Spanish flu of 1918 and one of the things she notes is the kind of women's networks women in these communities were constantly helping here so I kind of say here that um, this reinforces that the social medicine work that Rodriguez conducted was rooted in longer community practices of care that were led by women in underserved communities I think that's a big takeaway point that a lot of the time the work that needs to happen is already happening, but it tends to be happening a lot of times in these kind of unacknowledged spaces. It tends to be, you know, kind of these sort of community-based spaces. It tends to be kind of networks of care being created by some of the most marginalized communities because they have to. So I think we can go sometimes to those communities. And um, in my own research with Ana Livia uh, Cordero, who is a Puerto Rican physician as well, she talks a lot about this, the relationship between public health and society. And um, in any case, yeah, it's it's we just need to work together. We need to kind of be creative. And I just encourage all of us to realize that there's so many historical examples of marginalized communities who, even though they are the uh, bearing the brunt of all of these health effects, they sometimes um, are creating some of the most innovative practices. So I think the, the trick, my maybe call to action would be, how can we better build bridges between those types of work that can be maybe marginal, not acknowledged, and then bring them into these spaces to to just improve the quality of just experience for all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Placido. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> going to Professor Vilajic. Uh, her work focuses on uh, international migration, Latinos in the United States, health disparities, gender, and culture. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Sadia Feliciano, the director of the, of the Latin American Latin Studies Program, my colleague Francois for welcoming us and moderating us, and my fellow presenters. I, one of the reasons I decided not to have a PowerPoint presentation was because I knew it was 
going to be engaging. And I said, you know what, let's do the Argentinian way. I'm originally from Argentina, I'm an immigrant. And like many of my colleagues who were so passionately talking about what they did, how they got into doing research on COVID during the pandemic, something similarly happened to me. If I cannot solve a problem, at least I will try to understand it. So at the time the pandemic stroke, two, more than two years ago, I was supposed to go to El Paso, Texas to work with my colleagues on the asylum, asylum cases, uh, people trying to, still under the Proposition 42, trying to come to the United States and all the limitations that that put into immigrant dreams. And I couldn't do it. I moved quickly into understanding what it has been beautifully shown in these panels and the panel before about the health disparities. At the very, very beginning of the pandemic, you may remember the, all these actors and all these uh, fam famous people talking about, we are all in here together, the pandemic, it has shown us that we are all uh, vulnerable. Very quickly we learned that we are not all equally exposed. We are not equally suffering from the same virus. So we, very quickly I work uh, into health disparities, we publish, we work with other colleagues, and then right after I felt this was under control, this idea that health disparities are showing us how social inequality becomes evident through a virus, I started working on the pandemic of fear xenophobia. You remember 2020, who was the president at the time, right? So I published a lot about xenophobia, which is the xenophobia against Asian American uh, populations and about against Latinos as well. As you may remember, one of the uh, famous phrases was the refugee COVID Latino case, right? So I did a lot of work and I'm working still today on how the media and how public leaders contribute to reproducing this pandemic of fear, pandemic of hate, and how those pandemics have an impact in our health. Number one, because those translate into xenophobic and, and, and violence against our minority groups, but also that those fears become internalized. Internalized stigma is one of the issues that I've been working on. And one of the things I was going to present today, I don't have the time and my colleagues have done a better job, is to show you statistics about how students in, at CUNY have been dealing with the pandemic. And one of the take home message I had prepared was resilience square. What I learned from my students during pandemic times. One thing that we learned is not only about the um, struggles, but also the collateral benefits, had, had I put it. Collater by collateral benefits, I mean that students adapted. The amazing resilience that families and students of color have to deal with whatever comes their way. But one of the aspects of these collateral, collateral benefits is the paradoxical effect of the pandemic. And this is being very obvious when we look at mental health. Uh, with one of my colleagues, Sasha Radestins, who has been conducting a study on CUNY mental health, we learned that to name the COVID-19 related stressors that combine financial loss, food insecurity, lack of social contacts, and those stressors uh, correlate perfectly with depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress symptoms. In other words, the more, the higher a student is in the COVID-related stressor, the higher depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety is going to be. Um, suicidal ideation and alcohol uh, abuse is higher among those students who have higher cumulative cumulative stressors, particularly, particularly among students who are identified themselves as Asian and students who lack access to primary health providers. Why? We are talking about the invisible within the invisible, the DACA student, 
this is the group I'm working on right now, the undocumented population that has been the object of this xenophobic stigma that I was talking about before, and also the object of lack of access to healthcare, lack of access to resources. But let me give you good news. This is how I'm going to end, and I'm not going to take more than five minutes. The good news is that, and I'm so happy that uh, the results from the statistics uh, agree with my own results, because I've been doing one-on-one -on -one informal coaching with Latino students from day one. The statistics, as my colleague was saying, cannot tell us about people's experiences. That's why as, as a medical anthropologist and a sociologist, I listen to people's fears. I listen to what's going on with their life. One protective factor for all of us, and particularly for Latino and Caribbean immigrants, has been the multi-level social support networks relying on our communities, having fun, having people to talk to. Um, it's, it's called neighborhood level protection. And uh, keep into account, and this is super important, that when we're talking about cumul cumulative stress, we're talking about, about students who are playing and who are wearing five different hats. They are parents. They are children who take care of their parents back home. They are children who are supporting financially those parents, both back home and here in New York City. So we need to think, when we think about resilience, and this is the take home message to end my talk, about community-based resilient efforts. We cannot talk about individual level interventions anymore. And um, the take home message, therefore, is we need to use ecological and social justice perspective to think about students as part of a network. They are parents, they are children, they are grandchildren, they are breadwinners, they are amazing human beings. Then looking at the diversity of student experiences, the case of uh, an Asian American kid who is afraid for his life is not the same as a Latino undocumented individual who is afraid of being deported, right? Uh, and then thinking about this empowered visibility, becoming by more visible means on the one hand being stigmatized. Yes, we become very visible when we are the, the Latino other. Let's become visible by being agents of change. And then as a sociologist, I will say, uh, using our sociological imagination, always thinking in the worst, worst, worst feelings, when we think we're alone, to what extent my personal fear of dying, of pain and, and loneliness, is connected to that fear this, that is impregnating all the lives around me. Uh, take, last take home message, let's build together community resilient here and now. Thank you very much and thank you also to our provost, Betsy Henry, who is here joining us. Open to questions. Thank you, Prof Professor Veladric. I wanted to um, preserve some time if there were any questions, but one summary I would say from uh, the talk, the preservations, is that the lesson learned was first, if you are white, rich, educated, you survive COVID better than the rest of the population. But there were two strong words that came out here today shocks and resilience. I have one question for the panelists. One quick question. Shocks and resilience are the fabric of people of color in the United States. So what's new? Shocks and resilience are fabrics of the people of color in the United States. Um, so yes. So, so what's new? Right, in terms of what's new, um, I don't, I think what's new is that black people, Caribbean people, Latinx people finally said that um, I've kind of lived my entire life, my entire history, generational history, I'm dealing with shocks and having to be resilient. Um, but we're still human, we can still break, right? And we saw that and that's evident in and us dying and us, you know, talked about the high number of suicides. I, I come back to 
one of my students um, was the assistant principal, and one of her students, a, a young black um, Caribbean girl, sent the entire school admin a video. Um, and in that video, she is crying and appealing to teachers and, and admin to see her as human and not just someone who can take a shock and be resilient and push forward and still learn, right? Um, as educators, we think about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you're not safe, how could you learn? If you don't feel safe and supported, how could you, you know, be in a space where you're able to learn? So this kind of privileging of um, passing a test when you're dealing with you know, maybe your friend going out and not coming back because something happened to them, or maybe a friend passed of COVID-19. Um, so it's not enough to say that we, we can take it, that we can observe these shocks and that we can always be resilient and that we have grit. Um, we're also human. And generationally, we have had to take it. And so we're carrying the burden, not just of the burden we have now, but the burden of our ancestors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else wants to answer? Yeah. Thank you. So I think what's important and what's new here, well, first, nobody was expecting this, but as individuals and as a community, we can produce change. So this is a crisis. Humanity goes through crisis and, and grows constantly, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think this is an opportunity for us and for Queens College students to kind of introspect what our needs, what our fears, what our challenges, share them, brainstorm together, and then think what we can bring back to the community. And I would like to highlight that the resilience thinking workshops do exactly that. And although they started as a way to help Queens College students cope with the challenges related to, to, to the pandemic, what we've realized is that they're useful to cope with any kind of shock that life throws at you. And that most of us have very common shocks because we live in a community. And change is much easier at the individual level than at the community level. So by doing change at the individual and taking agency and empowerment, we can go out to the community and, and contribute to solving the challenges of our community. Thank and I you. think this pandemic has been a great opportunity to do that. And there's, you know, we now need to make sure we learn the skills so we can um, take advantage of this crisis to grow within it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the economist, do you want to answer that? Some of the shocks? So what's new in terms of, you know, we had some more billionaires uh, during the pandemic than uh, before. Yeah, very yeah. briefly, because I know everybody's yeah. tired. Yeah. I would agree with my colleagues. I think that even though we learned a lot from the pandemic in 19, 16, 18, we were not ready, right? I mean, it really took us all by surprise. And we are learning, guys, be patient with us. I'm talking to the students. Be patient, teach us. One of the things we do in my classes now is to do a little bit of self-introspective, compassionate thinking, right? I mean, and, and help, let's help each other. I think that this was a pandemic of humbleness for many of us. And resilient, I agree. I don't agree that it's only, there's only one way. Resilience can be a dual, like agency and a structure. I think it's built at the community and an individual level. And we, ha we can find, common uh, places would both coincide, for instance, in community meetings, town halls, etc. The small group and the big group ha have their own synergies, and the idea is to keep building it. The more, the merrier. The more, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to answer that question? No? Uh, I have a question for you, Professor Placido. Why hasn't there been more mobilization? For of all the examples you just gave and the impact on BIPOC people, right? It seems like we are getting back to normal as if nothing had happened in some ways. So why hasn't there been more mobilization to change things? Yeah, I, and then, you know, it's related to the last question, um, you know, 
uh, like exactly as a historian, you're like, is it, new? you know, what's new? And then it's hard to compare, but you know, it's, you're completely right that throughout the history of racialized populations in the Americas, um, I mean, especially in the Caribbean, when you consider Caribbean, when you think about the scale of um, essentially genocide that happened, yes, we have actually been at this level of scale. And in fact, I was just actually reviewing a book by a colleague, Vincent Brown, who writes about Jamaica. And he was um, actually talking about, because some of these diseases that existed in the Caribbean actually made the Europeans vulnerable as well. So we've also even been in the past in a, in a situation where we have a disease that can affect you whether you're rich or poor, or, right? So we know we've been, um, and I think then to answer your question, like why, I just think, I actually think more is happening than we can give it credit. So yes, perhaps um, right now you may not visibly see uh, students at CUNY uh, going to ask the administration certain questions, right? But I, I have a lot of hope when I see the types of discourses that are circulating, I think this crisis of COVID is probably one of the most uh, extreme crises of capitalism that we've seen, right, um, in this kind of moment in history. And it's made a lot of young people ask questions. I see those conversations and questions happening on social media all the time. So to me as a historian, I figure maybe it's just a matter of time for the, again, um, you know, the ideas, right? I think in a lot of social movements, usually there's this period in which the ideas are circulating first. They have to be articulated. They have to circulate. And then slowly the action will come. But I think this initial phase of just having these conversations, assessing, like having these kind of reflection moments, I mean, I think this is absolutely a necessary stage. So I don't think something won't happen. I think we're just at this stage where everyone's just getting their bearings. We're just now coming back in person this school year. So who knows what next year will look like. Um, but yeah, that's where I think we're at. All right. Thank you. And I'd like to invite um, the... Uh, students, participants to ask questions? So uh, it's a question, it's a statement. Um, Very short. I just want to say that uh, mobilization is supposed to happen. Uh, we saw uh, with like so many different slides and like I think every speaker said in one way or another that education um, was that um, way for students to find that solace and to um, like and that's that was the hope of um, upward mobility and even though we went uh, through the pandemic we saw the students GPA went up because we had policies that still helped those students thrive and still we saw that the economic impact allowed less students to get that education so uh, right now we're in this room like there's students there's faculty there's administration we need to just ask ourselves, what do we need to do to make sure that more students get that education? Um, CUNY, CUNY used to be free for over 100 years. Yeah. Uh, it only started charging tuition when students of color be became the majority. And we need to bring it back. Uh, and well, we say we're in a crisis right now. Well, CUNY had the biggest uh, expansion during the Great Depression. So it is possible, and it is possible when we talk about it. So again, like everyone, just go to your classrooms, talk to uh, your fellow students, talk to your friends, talk to your faculty. We need to get this mobilization going. So uh, just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Any reaction, comments from your panelists? Also, call your congressman, call your assemblyman. Thank you. Write emails to the governor. Um, let your voice be heard. Other questions? Yes. Uh, oh, thanks for that question. So the question was, did we prepare enough for the shock? Um, well, we did not prepare enough. Um, it was a shock, and as economists like to say, if we knew it was going to happen, we would have prepared for it. We did obviously have some pandemic uh, offices prior to the outbreak of the pandemic, and there is obviously some issue as to why those were uh, defunded prior to the pandemic. Um, I think if we tie this to the question of what's diff, what's new this time, I think um, what's new that, that, yes, your question is, this has always been the case, what's new this time? I think the new thing this time is that the shock has, ha has hit the education system, 
And the old way was, okay, we've had this shock, let's try to educate a few more people so the next shock is a little smaller. But this was a shock to the education system too. So now that went backwards as well. So not only have we got to try to educate a few more people so the next shock is not quite as bad, but we're starting from much further back than before. So I think that part is new and a lot worse. Uh, all the kids in school who are coming to us who are, didn't have as much preparation. So that, that's a problem. And then the next part of the, of the what's new and worse is um, how this changes how we think about preparing for public health emergencies and whether we were adequately prepared before, which clearly seems we weren't, what, that, what, what we learn from that and what I fear we might learn from it is, oh, well, we can never be prepared, so let's not even bother with even a few minor preparations, as opposed to the other lesson, which would be we need to be more prepared to deal with future shocks. And so I worry that what's new this time is that, that there are opportunities to undermine the public health system by saying, look how badly we failed this pandemic. Why bother with public health systems? Mm -hmm. Which I think is the wrong lesson, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of wrong uh, lessons out there, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, yes. I just wanted to say as an older student and a college, <laughs> um, this panel was amazing, like all the information that was given. I just wish that all these seats were filled with students, like what to do for next time to get the student to participate because there's really just half of the people not even half here and they need to listen to all this information that is so important for the future of our world and for the future of everything. So it's just a shame that not more students are here listening to this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question for you, Professor Gibson. We know that um, in terms of the health challenges, is mental health. That has mental health? Mental health. Yes. Yeah. So how, what kind of challenges have you encountered and how, how we, um, professors are coping with this or with students? With our students? Yes. Um, well, I mean, all of us have gone through um, many different challenges. Uh, you know, uh, as someone said, extend us grace as well. I know uh, specifically I extend my students a lot of grace um, over the last couple of years. Um, things that I wouldn't have maybe thought of two years ago um, in terms of just being understanding of their situations. But I, but I really focus on um, talking to them about being those agents of change for their students, right? So I'm a teacher of teachers. So I want to make sure that I'm modeling that grace and I'm modeling that understanding that everyone's going through um, challenges and not just physical challenges. We, you know, COVID, COVID was scary and now it seems like it's not scary anymore, right? But it's still scary for a lot of people. Um, we, and, and just the, the burden of having to feel um, worried about being in certain environments, right? Um, I have students who don't want to come to campus because they are they are worried about their uh, you know people that they have at home, right? That they that might be vulnerable, um, and I have to understand that. But I also want I also model that for them to understand when they're in their schools and they're when they're working with students from their community. So I'll be honest, like most of the students in my courses are are white middle class. Students, which is the which is the primarily what you know. If you look at the teaching force in America, that's what it is, right? Even last night, I went to my son's school, and every teacher that was talking to us, me and my wife, was a white lady. Um, and the, the the couple of uh, Latinx women were translating, and that's what. And my wife knows this. My wife's Latinx, and she translates whatever something has to come up that needs to be translated. Here, she has to come and she has to be the translator, and she's like. She'll make, oh, you know, in her opinion, it's like, why, always, why do I always have to do that? The point I'm trying to make is that um, when we are, when, when I'm trying to explain to the students in my class, I understand what you're, I'm trying to understand what you're going through from 
um, you know, a mental health perspective. And I'm not a trained mental health professional, right, at all. But you need to understand what the families who are even facing even dire more dire situations than you are, what they're going through, right? What their children are going through. And, have to, and most of the children that, that my students work with aren't able to express what's going on with themselves emotionally, right? Yeah. So it's, I think it's a matter of trying to um, extend that grace to everyone from, from down from my position and down to them, yeah. and then also allowing them to understand that, you know, we're all, you know, dealing with um, things that we never probably thought we would have to deal with and, 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 and make sure that, you know, you're communicating with the parents and making sure the parents know that you're there. Thank you. Well, this is the end of the um, uh, conference, uh, this, this section of the, of the panel. Thank you very much to all the panelists. You. you did a great job. And by the way, we are privileged to have them on campus. So we can always go visit them, talk to them, and follow up, and listen to their lectures and talks. So thank you very much. And uh, now, Zadia will take over. Thank you. Thank you. You can exit that way. Okay. Thank you, panelists. This was a wonderful session. We learned a lot. Thank you, Francois, um, for your great job moderating. And um, yes, like Francois said, uh, uh, Professor Pierre-Louis, um, we can see a lot of these people, um, you know, in, in their classrooms, they're wonderful. So thank you so much for the time and that you spent.